All right, this video is a race against my heat tolerance. I did it, I finally read The Odyssey. So I did not put these books in any particular order, so this might end up being a pain. Set in the future, <laughs> but it's also our past. <laughs> I wish there were business books written by people who are just trying to survive their jobs, but still need professional development and aren't circle jerking to capitalism. Hi, my name is Adriana and this is a wrap up for the months of June and July. I didn't get around to doing a wrap up in June. It was a very chaotic month of my life and the beginning of July was very chaotic and we just didn't get around to it. So we are just gonna lump June and July together. Most of my June reads I did a Wonderathon vlog for, so I should be able to just throw you to that vlog if you want to check out deeper thoughts. But as per usual, we will start with stats. So in the month of June, I read 13 books. That was 2,849 pages with my eyeballs. The average length of my eyeball reads was 316.6 pages. I listened to 42.5 hours of audiobook and my physical, oh, this is gonna be messed up because this just goes to the most recent today. So this is gonna be the same number between June and July because I don't figured that out timeline wise. But spoiler alert, my physical TBR is at 45 books. So that was all June. Let's look at some June graphs. My genre breakdown was mostly fantasy. Again, this was somewhat due to Wonderathon. I was on the team that got extra points for reading fantasy. So of course I'm gonna read a lot of fantasy. All of the books I read were adult or general audience. Series wise, I was kind of a blend of you know, stuff in a series, the end of a series, the start of a series, standalone. I was kind of all over the place with my series reading. Format, I had four audiobooks, four paperbacks, one hardback, and four ebooks. So even with it being a readathon time frame, I'm actually pretty impressed that I read so many non audiobooks. Although some of those are graphic novels, so that's like kind of telling the line. The source of where I got these books, as per usual, most of them came from the library. I actually owned four of them, which is pretty great that I was like digging into my backlog of stuff I own. And then one of them I bought within this year. Ratings wise, I was kind of all over the place. Most of what I read was a three star, did have have a five star or a couple five stars. We had a couple two stars. So again, kind of all over the place. That's what happens when I read a lot. It becomes a more normal distribution. <laughs> Where we are not getting a normal distribution is page length. I read a lot of shorties. Again, it was readathon time. We had to go, go, go. But we did have some longer-ish books in there, which is good. Year published, a lot of what I've read was that 2015 to 2019, which is kind of surprising to me. And then this is a new stat that I've added. So it might change a little bit as time goes on, but I added a stat of where I heard about the book from, uh, which was kind of fun and interesting to me personally, where I am getting most of my recommendations. And it turns out, most of what I, half of what I read, a little over half, I guess, was either a continuation of a series or an author I had read from before. So I was previously aware of this author's work and then basically one in every other category. So yeah, one I found browsing, one was a recommendation from booktube, one was from a book box subscription that I had previously subscribed to, one was from Twitter, uh, and then one I specifically sought out to fulfill a prompt in the readathon. So again, mostly stuff I'd read from before, but a lot of other avenues of how I'm finding these books. All right, so more stats, jumping to July. July was a weird reading month for me. Like I didn't have any readathons or anything, but I just read a lot. I don't know, kind of cool. In July, I read a total of 10 books. That was 1,892 pages. The average book length I had here was 236.5 pages. 24 hours of audiobook listening. And then again, that TBR number is the same because it's just the most up to date that I have. <laughs> Jumping into my genre breakdown, a lot more varied in this last month because I wasn't doing any readathons or anything. I kind of read whatever felt good. Again, my largest category is always gonna be fantasy, primarily 
read a lot of fantasy. And then I did read one young adult in this time frame. Again, mostly adult general audience is where I lie. I read a lot of standalones this last month, which generally is kind of my preference. I get anxiety of commitment to series. <laughs> And then format wise, five ebooks, three hardbacks, and only two audiobooks. So this is more the ratio I'm looking for. I would like a large majority of my reading to be with my eyeballs and less with my earballs, which I think part of that is the month of July. I really didn't do that much traveling for work. So I think that does affect my audiobook listening time. Where I sourced these books from, again, mostly from the library. A couple I had bought semi-recently, and then two I got from the publisher. Either NetGalley or a physical arc will go into it. My ratings were, I guess, kind of this, almost the same as June, but I just didn't have any two stars. Although I think I had more four stars than in June. I think I was like a little actually a little weighted on like the higher ratings and that feels right. I feel like I enjoyed my reading more in July. And then page length. I read a lot of shorties this month again and just in a in a short book mood. There's nothing wrong with that. Sometimes you can just read a short snappy book and that's what you need and keeps you motivated and having a good time. Year published. I read one old book. Yeah I'm comfortable calling less than 1989 old because I was born in 94 so that makes me not old. But yeah one older book and then again most of what I read is in 2020 and after. And then where I heard about books from this month, four of them were IRL recommendations or friend recommendations. This includes my booktube friends, which I will get into a little bit later, and only one series slash author I'd read, read from before, which it's like, what this is telling me is that I'm branching out a little bit, which is good to see. <laughs> I think the less of that orange we see, the better, which is unfortunate like, color picking on my part because orange is my favorite color. But yeah, a couple arcs, one from a book club, one from Twitter, one sought out for a readathon, kind of all over the place once again. Okay, so with that, let's get into the book by book breakdown. So I did not put these books in any particular order, so this might end up being a pain. So the first book I finished in June was some Desperate Glory. Wow, you can't see that at all. This was poor planning on my part by Emily Tesh. This was supposed to be a read for Galacticthon in May and I just didn't quite finish it in May so it bled over into June. But this is a story of after humans get kind of defeated in this galactic war, there's like a fringe offset of kind of like human nationalists. I don't know, can you call it nationalist if it's like, I don't know, I don't know what to call it. But it's like a fringe group living on this meteor asteroid. I don't know the difference. I was not a space girly. And they're kind of in this like totalitarian militaristic society and their whole goal is to try to like bring the human race back to like what it used to be and they all like work really hard in like training like the biggest thing you can do is like become a warrior and this gal who's like the top of her class is like sure she's gonna get into like this elite group of soldiers is told that her assignment now that she is an adult is she's gonna be a breeder and she's not a big fan and it starts to deprogram her a little bit. So this was just a really cool exploration of deprogramming and xenophobia and how fringe groups relate to like a larger population of people. Like I don't want to spoil too much by talking about this, but it's just, it's very good. It is very like detailed, it's very in depth, the world building is really incredible. This is a very, very good space opera sci-fi that I would highly recommend if you're into the political critique space opera genre of fiction. I think I gave this, yeah, I gave this like four and a half stars. I did find it a little bit slow, like being a space opera, like epic sci-fi is not always that gripping to me. <laughs> so it was a little slow in parts for me, 
but overall I really loved the messaging of this, the theming. I remember so much of this plot even though I read it almost two months ago, which is crazy to me because I'm usually like eject the plot as soon as I'm done reading. So I think that's a good, a good sign here. The next book I finished was Divine Might by Natalie Haynes. So much in the vein of Pandora's Jar that she wrote before this that was you know, further exploring Greek heroines in mythology. This is exploring the Greek goddesses of Greek mythology. <laughs> She's further delving into their stories and kind of how we have different political and feminist reads on their stories. I really like, I really like Pandora's Jar. I really like this. I think it's a great pairing with any sort of Greek mythology retelling you want to do. Natalie Haynes is a comedian and also a Greek mythology scholar, so she has really great like knowledge on this topic, but also has a really fun voice and is being like a nonfiction, so it reads really fun and isn't like super dry and academic, even though she does have good credentials. The next book I finished in June was Black Friend Essays by Ziwei. This is kind of like memoir collection of essays from Ziwei, comedian who kind of like blew up over the past couple years. She is so funny. She does these incredible, I don't really know what to call her interviews because they're like somewhat satire, but she's asking like real questions. Like it's just funny in the way that she is so comfortable in an awkward moment. Like she seems to really revel in making her guests as uncomfortable as humanly possible. <laughs> so if you haven't checked out like any of her interviews or stuff on YouTube, I would 100% recommend. She is so, so funny. And the same thing with these essays. Again, she is so funny and smart and she really talks about her experience as the child of immigrants and coming up as a young female black comedian and just kind of like her life story which is really fascinating and funny. Five stars. Loved, loved this book. The next book we have on the docket is The Odyssey translated by Emily Wilson. I have had this book for so long. <laughs> Was it kind of unhinged to read this for a readathon? Absolutely. But honestly, not as unhinged as I originally thought it was going to be. This is the only Odyssey translation I have read, but based on her like introduction and translator's note, she really wanted to focus on making the Odyssey more accessible. So instead of using, I guess, more formal or academic language, like language you would see in like a 1960s literary fiction, she is using modern English. Not like slang. I don't know the best way to explain this, but this is very easy to read and very easy to understand and you can just kind of like sit back and enjoy the story of the Odyssey. I will say, I think narratively the Odyssey is not uh, the, the Odyssey as written by Homer is not it for me. I enjoy this story as a whole. I enjoy it better when it's rewritten for a modern audience. <laughs> so this story is told in a very like disjointed and weird way where we start like basically when Odysseus is already back in Greece and then we get his whole journey as flashbacks while he's just talking to random strangers. Narrative wise, kind of weird. The way we get the story, not ideal, but I am glad I read the original canon and you know, here we are. I did it. I finally read the Odyssey. She does have a translation of the Iliad that I will definitely be picking up because I think she is just an incredible translator and deserves all the credit in the world for actually getting me to read original sources. <laughs> the next book I finished was Kekai. So I actually listened to this as an audiobook for Wonderathon. This was, you know, I'm doing an awful lot of talking for something that I've already talked about in a vlog. Watch the vlog. I talk about it there, but it's good. I would recommend it as someone who likes mythology retellings. The next one is Sunbringer. This was also a read for Wonderathon. I talk about it in my Wonderathon blog. I will say I'm not loving the series as a whole, but the covers are so pretty. I'm probably going to keep reading them so that I can just have the collection of them on my shelves. Oops. 
The next book I finished was Before the Coffee Gets Cold. I listened to this as an audiobook, also for Wonderathon. You can check out my thoughts in the vlog. Lore Olympus, Volume 6, same thing. It's Lore Olympus. I enjoy it. It's good. Uh, the Wicked and the Divine, Volume 3. Not loving this series very much anymore, but it's great for a readathon because it's short, and especially for readathons that reward continuing on in series. So I will probably continue on in this series, even though I don't really love it. The Testaments, loved this, came out of nowhere. I mean, it's Margaret Atwood. Not really coming out of nowhere that I enjoyed it. She's an incredible author. But again, check out the Wonderathon blog. The Wicked and the Divine, volumes four and five, Wonderathon. And that's June. We did it, fam. But the first book I finished in July was Mrs. Covington. So this is actually a, an indie author from Washington State, actually only an hour and a half from where I used to live in Washington State. Uh, I found out about him on Twitter. We were like Twitter mutuals and he had put up a Kickstarter for this book. And if you, I think it was like a hundred dollar tier, you could actually get yourself written in as a character. So myself, my husband and my dog Trip are all little side characters, like kind of like cameo kind of characters in this book. The main character runs across us while on a hike. So, I don't know, it's fun. And this is a really cute, kind of cozy fantasy story about a young man who wants to strike out on an adventure, gets told that he does not have sea legs and should probably stop trying to become a pirate, and then is just like on this island and ends up buying this kind of failing pub. So he works with the bartenders there to kind of bring the pub back to life and inventing nachos along the way. There's this capybara who's kind of the mascot of this pub. It's just really cute. It's fun. It's exactly what you want from a cozy fantasy. It's got good food. It's got good people. It's got silly side quests. Like, it's just great. This was a very fun, enjoyable book. I gave it three stars. It was just, it is a cozy fantasy, but even for that, a lot of it felt kind of slow to me personally, but it was just, it was a fun, cozy time. I would recommend it if you're into cozy fantasy. So the next book I read was a friend pick from Ruby at Ruby Red. Uh, that was Migrations. I have a vlog up about this book, so you can check out my deeper thoughts here. But basically, this is a heartbreaking story about a biologist following the last migration of the Arctic Tern from the North Pole to the South Pole. It is heart-wrenching and so interesting and an incredible character study. I will say this is less about birds and more of a character study of the main character, but she is fascinating, so keep an eye out. The next book I read was Take My Hand. This is an historical fiction based on a real life court case and I am blanking on the court case now. So it is based on the true story of the Ralph sisters. So they were two sisters who were sterilized without their family's permission at the ages of 12 and 14 in the 70s. Yeah, this book takes inspiration from that real life story. We are following the nurse of this family whose job it is to provide them birth control while she is like getting to know and to love this family finds out that the birth control she is prescribing is probably not as safe as she thought it was and then through other events these two little girls get taken and sterilized this is a heartbreaking novel like truly gut-wrenchingly horrific it's hard for me to really like put into words how impactful like it really is for me to keep you know reminding myself that like systematic racism is still alive and well to this day and like this was the 1970s like not that long ago in the grand scheme of things like my parents were born in the 60s so this was within my parents lifetime this was only 20 years before I was born. So it's just like wild, like how, I don't know. This is a very well-written book. It is 
so so good. I think I wish it I knew a little bit more about the story it was based on before I went into it. I typically go into my books like blind 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 but I think this is one I would have appreciated knowing a little bit more of the behind the scenes and what it was based on before I went into it. So I would definitely recommend looking into the case a little bit and I don't know if this book included content warnings or trigger warnings in the beginning of it but there's there's some there's some content warnings to be had with this novel. So the next book I finished is one I have been slowly chipping away at for work over many many months but that is Good Profit by one of the Koch brothers. I don't know. I don't know the difference between them. This is like a non-fiction business book on management. I was reading it for work just for kind of professional development reasons. I have very differing opinions from the author on most things, but I do like a lot of what he says about his management style and what they try to implement at their different businesses. Seems like being management at a Coke Industries business is not half bad. Having to deal with the repercussions of Coke Industry and I feel like being an hourly worker at Coke Industries probably terrible. <laughs> That's it. That's all our, the attention I really want to give this book. I wish there were business books written by people who are just trying to survive their jobs but still need professional development and aren't circle jerking to capitalism. The next book I finished was Archangel. This was a, an arc provided to me by William Morrow, so thank you very much to them. I will have a vlog, or maybe I already have a vlog out about this book? I don't quite know, but either way, I'll let you know. This is the 18th installment in the Sigma Force series by James Rollins, my favorite series in the whole world. Again, I will have deeper thoughts and discussions in my vlog on this book, and I'm gonna go get it signed in Scottsdale, Arizona here in a couple days, which I'm very excited about. The next book I finished was another friend recommendation from Danielle at Danielle Reads, and that is Your Dad Will Do. This is also in that vlog. It is like a erotic novel about a woman who is having revenge sex with her ex almost father-in-law, with her ex fiance's dad. Whatever. The next book I finished was Medea. I will have this in a NetGalley vlog so you can check out deeper thoughts on that, but it is a Greek mythology story of Medea. I didn't enjoy it as much as the other Medea retelling I read, but I still think it was really good and had an interesting, unique take on the story as a whole. And then the next book I finished was also a NetGalley arc, and that will be in that same vlog as Medea, and it is Daughters of Olympus. This is a retelling of the Persephone and Hades retelling, but it focuses a lot more on the Demeter side of it, which I thought was really fun and interesting. I feel like in a lot of our Persephone and Hades retellings, Demeter is either framed like as a villain or is just ignored completely. So it was cool to get to explore her character more and really delve into that side of the story. And then my final pick for that friend reading vlog was the Backstagers Volume 1. This was so cute and I will 100% be continuing on in this series. It's so fun. The art style is so pretty and just fun to look at. I think all the characters are really fun and interesting, so great. Oh, this was a pick from Martine, from just Martine. So great pick, Martine. Thank you so much. And then finally, the last book I slid into July, like literally like started it on July 30th, finished it yesterday, July 31st. That was Lathe of Heaven by Ursula K. Le Guin. This book in the first half, I thought was gonna be one of my favorite books of all time and then kind of lost me in the second half. It is set in the city of Portland in the future from when it was written. So it was written in 1971 and I think the future it's set in is like 2000 to 2005 kind of in that time frame. So set in the future. <laughs> but it's also our past. <laughs> so it was fun to read a book about kind of my new, the new city in which I live. It follows this man who can change reality with his dreams, but not like 
purposefully. So we follow him right as he gets in trouble for taking people's like pharmacy cards to get barbiturates and things to try to help suppress his dreams because it's really stressing him out that he can change reality. And he gets put into forced therapy to kind of help him get through this drug problem. And so it's like a really cool like exploration of like the morality of trying to make the world better but by using this really strange way to go about it and how you know the weird world of dreams can like misinterpret the input we're giving them and the output that is like caused by these dreams it is so so cool and then in the second half it, it kind of loses me like I feel like this happens I've only read two Ursula K. Le Guin books at this point, Left Hand of Darkness and now this book, but both this and Left Hand of Darkness, I really loved the first half and I really loved the premise, but the full execution, like it doesn't just, it doesn't quite stick the landing for me. So it's a four star, but I really, really like this book and I will be thinking about it a lot. And also just a fun little side story. They talk about the fact that you can see Mount St. Helens from downtown Portland, but there's no way Ursula K. Le Guin could have known that in 1980, Mount St. Helens was going to blow its top and now you can't see it from Portland anymore. It's like half the size it was. So that's just kind of a funny thing that like accidentally dated this story a little bit. <laughs> but yeah, those were all the books I read in June and July. It was a lot. I read a lot and hopefully I can pare down this video to not be quite as a lot as it feels right now. But I gotta stop recording because I am dying of heat stroke without the AC on. So thanks so much for watching and I will catch you on the next video.